One day, a Japanese soldier decided to bring a little comfort to his grim days working for the army and let his bathroom break run over. The Japanese man didn't know that, in doing so, he would wipe out millions of lives. His fellow soldiers thought he had been captured by the Chinese, as this affair occurred on Chinese soil. They gave them an ultimatum, demanding they return their soldier, but the Chinese didn't know who they were talking about and therefore couldn't meet their demands. Then, after two days, on June 7, 1937, the Empire of Japan declared war on the Republic of China. And in this release of Histographics, we'll be telling you about a war that broke out because a soldier was absent on the toilet. Armed conflicts have also occurred across the world for more absurd reasons. In particular, the Ugandan dictator Idi Amin Dada comes to mind. It cost this odious ruler nothing to lay claim to the title of King of Scotland or Sovereign of Great Britain. He made some indecent proposals to Queen Elizabeth II of England, demanding a boxing match with the President of the Republic of Tanzania. And in 1978, Idi Amin declared war on the USA, claiming that he would wipe them from the face of the earth. Washington never learned of his attack, so no reaction followed. The African ruler considered this surrender and announced Uganda's victory the next day. Such a war, of course, is more likely interpreted as a joke. But in 1969, die-hard fans in the qualifying games of the World Cup between El Salvador and Honduras weren't joking. When El Salvador won 3-0, fans on the losing side started a cruel battle in the stands. They killed dozens of the El Salvadorian's national team's fans and crippled many. The country responded by sending troops into neighboring regions of Honduras. The military action lasted 72 hours, but in such a short space of time, more than 3,000 people had managed to die. And all the same, this could be called a small conflict compared to the Sino-Japanese War. As we were saying, it also began for an amusing reason. A soldier from the Japanese Empire had stayed in the bathroom too long. But very soon it turned into a real slaughter, which in the space of eight years, drowned 35 million people into a bloody mess. Japan had its eyes on China for some time for its rich lands and natural resources. By 1937, the empire had taken Manchuria and the Ri province and sought to further increase its influence in China. Armed conflicts had sparked up between the countries all the time. Japan, historians say, had no plans to add a full-scale war to them. The Imperial Soldiers' Bathroom Break, who, as it happened, was discovered shortly after, changed that situation. Because of him, on July 7, 1937, military divisions from both countries met not far from Beijing on Lugao Bridge, known also by the name Marco Polo Bridge, both sides firing not only guns, but also cannons. The incident served as cause for Japan to start a war with China. Immediately after the enemy's attack, China's two main forces, that is, the nationalist government with Chai Kang-shek at its head, and the Communist Party formed a united front of defense. But the much better trained and equipped Japanese troops quickly managed to capture Beijing, the Shaha province, and part of the Siwan province. Only by September did the situation change. The military prowess of the Chinese army rose and a powerful partisan movement was formed. At the same time, the Japanese encountered problems with their supplies and for a short time halted their advance. The empire redeployed 300,000 troops as well as tanks and planes to its invasion force and was able to occupy Shanghai. Already, the invaders were showing previously unseen cruelty to their adversaries. One competition between two Japanese officers is an apt example. They argued over who could cut down 100 Chinese people with their sword first while they marched to Zijian Mountain. When they arrived at that place, each of the officers killed over 100 people, although it was impossible to determine who finished off their 100th enemy first and won the bet. Those gallant soldiers then decided to lead one more battle, to be the first to decapitate 150 people. It's not known whether a second bloody contest took shape, but the murderers paid for their first with their lives. Following Japan's surrender, both officers were arrested after a trial and were executed for crimes against humanity. However, the officers' cruel entertainment pales in comparison to the bloody slaughter that followed Najing City's capture, which was at the time the Chinese capital. Bursting into the city after a long siege, the Japanese killed more than 200,000 people in the space of five days. 
First, they executed all prisoners of war who they had managed to capture. They wasted no cartridges on their victims, nor did they dull the swords against them. The executioners just buried their captives alive in a gigantic trench 300 meters long and 5 meters wide. This mass grave is called the Pit of 10,000 Corpses. So many soldiers and officers lie there, for certain nameless. According to various estimates, the number buried there ranges between 4 and 20,000. The Japanese killed even more of the Chinese forces and civilian population on the bank of the Yangtze River. In this mass execution, known as the Straw String Gorge Massacre, 57,000 people were killed. From morning right up to midday, the Japanese soldiers tied prisoners to each other and in the evening opened fire on them. The savage punishment lasted nearly an hour, and all that time the victims screamed wildly out of pain and fear. Residents of the surrounding areas recall the blood-chilling sounds were audible many kilometers from the execution place. After this, the Japanese soldier killed any who had survived with their bayonets and threw their bodies into the river. A fate no less cruel awaited the non-military population. Nearly 1,300 Chinese people, the majority of whom were civilians, were chased by the Japanese to Taiping Gate. There, victims were first blown up by mines and then covered in petrol and turned into human torches. The American journalists Tillman Durden and Archibald Steele were witnesses to this event. They recall that the mountain of bodies at the city's gate was almost two meters tall and contained many women and children. Young women who had stayed alive were raped en masse. Pregnant women were particularly desired. After raping them, the soldiers took pleasure in ripping apart their stomachs with their bayonets. Still more horrifying is the testimony of the missionary Ralph Phillips, who witnessed the slaughter. The missionary said they forced him to watch how the Japanese disemboweled a Chinese soldier and roasted and ate his heart and liver. After the war, Japanese soldiers also told tales of instances of cannibalism. When supplies didn't reach them, they had cooked the meat of their captives for lunch more than once. Following Nanjing's capture, while all this happened, the invaders continued their advance. The Chinese forces violently opposed them and sometimes were successful. For example, in June 1938, they sustained an attack by the Japanese army in the town of Hankou as they made for Zhangzhou. The defenders destroyed all the dams on the Yellow River and the water flooded surrounding areas. And along with the land, a great deal of Japanese soldiers, tanks, and weaponry were also submerged. However, the Imperial forces soon moved their advance to the south, having succeeded in taking Hankou. So gradually over two years, one after the other, they were able to capture the majority of major towns in the west of the country and control most of the railways. During their advance, the Imperial forces stuck to their scorched earth policy, or more precisely, the three alls policy. Kill all, loot all, burn all. More often, only young women were left alive, but a terrible fate also awaited them. Female captors were sent to brothels for those serving to so-called comfort stations. By different estimates, anywhere from 50 to 300,000 young girls were sent there, mainly 14 to 15-year-olds. Only a quarter of their prisoners were able to survive. Each of them was raped daily by no less than 20 men. One of the former female prisoners recollected, it didn't matter whether it was day or night, whatever the time, as soon as one soldier left, another would immediately come in. We tried to stop each other from committing suicide, but we weren't always successful. Several girls took opium from the soldiers' pockets and they'd take it all in one go, so they'd die from an overdose. Others used towels or their own clothing to hang themselves in the bathroom. This still wasn't the worst place a civilian could be sent to from occupied territory though. Ending up in Unit 731, where they performed mad experiments on people, was considered a fate worse than death. They froze captives, capturing the slightest details of agony on film. They caused frostbite in the people's limbs to observe gangrene spread. They also poured boiling water on test subjects, roasted them, starved them of food and water, and subjected them to bursts of electric currents and vivisections, surgical operations done for research. Sadists in white lab coats cut open dozens of living people. They gradually extracted all their vital organs from partially anesthetized patients, hearts, liver, kidneys, brain. They then performed other experiments with their still beating organs. Another division, Unit 100, performed similar experiments with animals and developed a biological weapon. 
The Japanese used it to make up for lacking numbers in battles, where there were many more Chinese troops. In 1940, the Imperial Army Air Service launched 300 ceramic bombs into Ningbo City, containing fleas infected with the bubonic plague. Japan also employed chemical attacks in the battles against Zuzhou, Kaifeng, and Wuhan. China didn't have its own supply of poisonous gas to carry out a retaliatory attack. The army was poorly equipped, outfitted, and trained. As a result, despite significant superior numbers compared to the enemy, it suffered eight and a half times more losses. But the beastliness of the occupants evoked a huge hatred among the population, and the people resisted as they could. Civilians and soldiers organized suicide units to resist the enemy. Suicide bombers tied packets with grenades and dynamite to their bodies and then threw themselves under tanks or into the enemy tanks. In this way, one Chinese suicide bomber blew up 20 Japanese soldiers with him. Another, in the battle at Shanghai, stopped a column of Japanese tanks. Furthermore, in 1940, after long disputes, the Communist Party and China's government forces managed to reach an agreement. On the 20th of August, with two Chinese armies and partisan unions in the provinces of Hanar, Chihar, Shangzi, and Hubei, began a wide-scale attack together. More than 400,000 soldiers and officers took part. In this conflict, called the Battle of 100 Regiments, China's victory in this battle allowed them to free 73 towns with more than 5 million inhabitants. However, the Republic of China continued to lose the war in the bigger picture and was close to total defeat. It was saved by the help of the World War II allies, who had only just achieved victory over the fascists. In 1945, the American and English armed forces destroyed the Japanese Navy and Air Force. And in the USSR, their major land force, the Kuomintang Army, was annihilated. In September, Japan announced its complete surrender. Subsequently, only 56 Chinese prisoners of war walked to freedom. The remainder had been killed. The chance of a person dying in a nationalist camp was 40%. But in the case of a Japanese camp, this figure rose to 70%. Many historians believe that the Japanese killed more civilians than the fascists did. What do you think? Which of these two regimes was worse when it came to exterminating human life? We're waiting for your opinions in the comments section. And if you liked this video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe to our channel, and definitely press that bell so you don't miss any of our new releases.